G'day guys and welcome to this business management lesson. In today's lesson we're looking at key knowledge point 322. That is unit 3, area of study 2 and the second key knowledge point for this area of study. Today specifically we'll be looking at the first part of this key knowledge point. That is the key principles of three theories of motivation. Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory, Locke and Latham's goal setting theory and Lawrence and Noria's for drive theory. Today we'll be specifically looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory. I'll remind you that in this area of study, human resources management, when we talk about motivation we're talking about the inspiration and drive that underpins how and why people behave the way they do. We established in the last lesson that engaged and motivated employees are more productive and efficient. And as human resource managers, we want to ensure that our employees are engaged and motivated. These three theories describe different theories, um, different um, philosophies that might help you understand how and why someone might be motivated. As a human resources manager, if you have some employees who are engaged and motivated and others who aren't, it might be very helpful to use one of these theories to try and work out why one of some of your employees are motivated and others aren't, so that you can try and replicate the conditions that led to the motivation of some of your employees and replicate those conditions for the employees who aren't motivated in the goal, uh, with the goal of trying to make them motivated as well. Now, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory is a theory that was published uh, first in 1943 by Abraham Maslow. And in this theory, Maslow describes that humans have motivators that drive their behavior and their thinking. They're the source of motivation for humans. And that uh, at the very base level, we are all driven by the same things and will, be continue, will continue to be driven by these motivators until we have met the needs described by a motivator. And then we'll move on to the next level of motivator. So at the base level, Maslow says that we are all driven to achieve our physiological needs. These are the things that you need for survival, the biological requirements of being a human being. Air to breathe, water and food to sustain your body, shelter and clothing to protect you from the elements. These are your physiological needs. Maslow says that once you've achieved your physiological needs, you will um, stop being motivated to pursue those. You've got them now and you'll next be driven to achieve safety both short and long term. This can be as simple as not wanting to be attacked by a vicious animal uh, to wanting to ensure you have the capacity to continue to feed yourself into the future and to continue to care for the people that make up your family unit. Love and belonging comes next. Once you've achieved your physiological needs and you've achieved a sense of security, you will pursue uh, strong and meaningful relationships with others. Uh, this can be friendships, this can be romantic relationships, uh, perhaps even strong working relationships and rivalries would fall under this category. Once someone feels they have a well-established network of strong and meaningful relationships, someone will no longer necessarily be putting their primary motivation into establishing and maintaining these relationships, but instead they'll be working towards building a sense of self-esteem. If you've got love and belonging from outside, the next most important thing is that you feel love and belonging um, on the inside, that you feel valued, that you feel valuable, that you feel you're making a positive contribution um, in the lives of the people around you, and that you can see that they appreciate you for that. And finally, once you are happy with the way that you fit into the world and the impact you're having on your environment, People will be motivated to achieve self-actualization, which describes achieving someone's full potential. For employees in a business, achieving your full potential would describe the state of being most engaged and motivated. And this is where this theory lines up really nicely with our um, fundamental principle that engaged and motivated employees are more productive and efficient. According to Maslow, the most engaged and motivated people are also going to be the most productive and efficient when they're self-actualizing and achieving their full potential. Now, Maslow's motivators can be broken down into two categories. 
First, there are the extrinsic needs, these base level motivators, the physiological needs and the security and safety needs. These are described as extrinsic motivators because they can be satisfied by others. Extrinsic means outside of yourself. And if someone else can fulfill these motivators for you, they are extrinsic motivators. For example, someone can bring you food and water. Someone else can build you a shelter. Someone else can clothe you. And certainly when it comes to safety and security, someone else can keep you safe. So for employees and considering this from a business management perspective, businesses are able to provide these things for employees to help ensure that their base level motivators will be met. The intrinsic motivators, however, can only be satisfied from within. And businesses might be able to contribute to the realization of these motivators, but because these are intrinsic, each employee is going to need to come to terms with whether or not they've achieved these motivators themselves. And perhaps psychologists can help. Therapy might be able to help in some of these cases, uh, but in other cases, it's down to each individual to um, introspectively determine what they're working towards and what's motivating them at any one time. Certainly, whether you feel loved is going to be intrinsic. Whether you feel like you're worthy uh, for the self-esteem level is going to be intrinsic. And whether or not you are capable of being motivated to working towards achieving your full potential is another intrinsic consideration. So Maslow described his theory like this. He said that starting at the bottom, humans are driven to achieve whatever it is that that motivator describes, and then they'll move up once it's achieved, once it's fulfilled, they'll move up and be driven to achieve the next motivator in the hierarchy. Maslow was very clear that once a motivator is achieved, or that level is fulfilled, whatever language you would like to use to describe this concept, that that thing is no longer motivating. Someone who has all of the food and water and air, uh, someone who is no longer at risk of dying imminently, will no longer be motivated necessarily by their physiological needs and their immediate survival, but they'll instead be motivated to work on their short and long-term safety and security. In this scenario, in this example, let's assume that that person then finds a way to achieve short and long-term safety and security. They would then be driven to um, think about their loneliness and the relationships that they might wish they had. Certainly it might be helpful for this scenario to think about someone who's stranded on a desert island. Once they have achieved their immediate needs, fresh drinking water and food and enough sleep, then they'll be thinking about their safety and security, maybe looking for a shelter, some sort of cave, um, thinking about writing help on the beach in stones and driftwood to attract the attention of any overhead aeroplanes um, to try and establish safety and security. And then once, once relative safety and security is established, perhaps uh, someone stranded on a desert island would be driven to consider any relationships that they um, had and hope to resume, perhaps if they're being crippled by loneliness, they might put a smeary handprint on a volleyball and call it Wilson and make a friend for themselves to feel like they've got a relationship there. Um, perhaps once that relationship's established, this survivor, um, this outcast might be um, driven to consider how strong they're becoming and how fit they're becoming, uh, working on pursuing their survival on this island. Uh, they might be very proud of what they've achieved, um, but then certainly, and so this is something that Maslow didn't necessarily describe, but it's something we need to consider as business managers, factors and people's circumstances can change. And so while someone is no longer motivated by one of these motivators or needs or drives, once it's achieved, once it's fulfilled, should uh, that motivator suddenly become unfulfilled, the higher order motivators above it are no longer the priority. And say our friend Wilson, the volleyball, floats away in the tide and you lose your one friend on this desert island, you'll once again be driven and motivated to pursue meaningful relationships, to give your life meaning in that regard. Now, as business managers, we don't really need to worry about our employees being stranded on a desert island all too often. 
far more likely they'll have the normal trials and tribulations that come with being a human in the modern world. And we need to be prepared to try and identify, using Maslow's theory, what uh, motivators our employees have met and what we can help them to achieve on their way to being self-actualizing. And why do we need to do this? Well, if engaged and motivated employees are more productive and efficient, and a self-actualizing employee is the most motivated someone can be, well, then we have to conclude that a self-actualizing employee is the most engaged and motivated, and therefore will be the most productive and efficient. So as a manager, what can you do? Well, to help someone in achieve their physiological needs or to help ensure that their physiological needs are met, you can pay them a living wage. Now, a living wage is a wage or a salary that helps someone afford the cost of living. This is a fancy term that basically describes paying someone enough that they can afford rent uh, in reasonable conditions. They can afford shelter that will help to um, keep them warm or cool enough to um, survive in ongoing conditions, uh, to help them afford the cost of nutrition, help them to buy groceries, uh, and any other factors that come with the necessities of living, paying their electricity and gas bills for heating and cooling, the facilities to cook, um, et cetera, et cetera. If you're paying a living wage, you can expect that by and large your employees can afford to manage their physiological needs. And certainly you can provide reasonable conditions at work too. Make sure that you're not asking your employees to work in uh, conditions that are so poor that their actual survival is at jeopardy. Certainly, once someone in your employment is eating and drinking and sleeping enough that they'll survive, we can help them achieve their safety and security needs. Their physical safety and security, particularly in Australia, is largely managed uh, at a minimum by occupational health and safety legislation. It is entirely illegal for you to be reckless or careless with the lives of your employees. So, it's important, both as an HR manager and just a manager of employees in a business at all, that you are working to identify your oh &S requirements and you are complying with those requirements and, as often as you can, exceeding those requirements. The more care you take to protect your employees, the safer they will feel. And certainly, safety and security isn't just about physical safety, um, but a sense of mental safety um, is also necessary and one way that you can help an employee to feel secure is to provide long-term and ongoing employment contracts. Employees who feel that their ability to derive a wage, that their employment is at risk because their contract might be coming up to its expiry or perhaps they've heard rumblings that the business might be making some redundancies, might soon be starting to fear for their own um, safety and security in the sense of having ongoing employment. So you as an HR manager can ensure that your business as much as is practical is providing long-term and ongoing employment contracts to help achieve that motivation for your employees. Now, these intrinsic motivators, once again, aren't things that you can necessarily achieve for your employees, but you can implement strategies and conditions to try and help employees achieve these things. For instance, to help employees build relationships, you might implement social gatherings, morning teas, um, birthday celebrations, after work drinks, um, just work gatherings outside of hours uh, to try and facilitate um, interaction and conversation between employees to try and help them build relationships. Certainly open plan workspaces are known to facilitate and encourage conversation and collaboration. That can be another way that you help your employees build relationships. And certainly involving your employees in consultation or the teamwork of participation in decision making will mean that they're working together and that working together opportunity might help them to build relationships. Assuming that they've got meaningful relationships, whether these are work-based or outside of work, employees might be driven to achieve their self-esteem needs. And ways that you can help an employee to build a sense of self-esteem is to show them that you value them as an employee. So offering them career advancement opportunities or helping them pursue and achieve 
career advancement opportunities through promotion might be one way that you show them how valued they are. Other ways might be the delegation of responsibility or once again, involvement in decision making. If that reflects that you value that employee, that might help them build a sense of self-esteem. And certainly recognizing and rewarding employees for contributions to the business or for achievements is another way that you can show that you recognize their work and that you value their efforts. And that might help them to build their own sense of self-esteem. And finally, for employees who are working towards achieving their maximum potential, give them a challenge. Give them work that tests their intellect and their skills and their abilities. Uh, give them freedom for creative expression and for problem solving. Give them an opportunity to be challenged and to succeed under their own strengths and um, on the basis of their own strengths will help them work towards their full potential. In summary for this key knowledge point, Maslow proposed that there are individual motivators that drive human motivation and that individuals are driven to achieve whichever of these motivators is the lowest order and the lowest order unachieved currently. Maslow said that any higher order motivator is irrelevant until the lower order motivators are achieved. So the physiological needs are the only thing that's relevant until they're met. And then someone will work up to considering their safety and security needs. Then we'll work up to the love and belonging needs. Higher order up the hierarchy as we go. As business managers, we can target employees' current levels of motivation and implement specific strategies to try and help them to achieve whichever motivators it is that they don't currently have achieved. And the reason we do this is because we know that engaged and motivated employees are more productive and efficient. And we now know that a self-actualizing employee is the most engaged and motivated that someone can be, according to Maslow. By that logic, if engaged and motivated employees are more productive and efficient, then a self-actualizing employee who is the most engaged and motivated must be the most productive and efficient. That's all for today. See you next time.